Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. Today I speak to Dr. Emily Amos. We're going to talk about a big uncomfortable topic, mental health. We're going to talk about stress, chronic stress, and ultimately burnout. We're going to learn about Em's story and how we as financial advisors can make sure that we are proactively managing our mental health journey. The conversation is confronting because many of the things that she talks about are symptoms that I personally have experienced and you might have as well. I hope that from today's chat, you're able to use some of the red flags to really think strategically about how it is that you're living and whether you two are on the path to burnout. Hello, Dr. Emily Amos. Hi, Jess. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I am so excited and, if I'm very honest, a bit nervous about today's conversation because I suspect as we go through today's conversation, I'm going to have a lot of revelations about all the things that I should be doing a little bit differently. <laughs> now, I am keen to jump straight into it. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your story? So I am a GP. Um, I've also got a lot of other hats that I wear on top of that, that one. I'm mm-hmm. a, a registered yoga teacher, registered meditation teacher. I'm also an international board certified lactation consultant. Mm-hmm. And as you can guess, I'm the sort of person who chases training, <laughs> pursues mm-hmm. knowledge, <laughs> mm-hmm. and likes to stay very busy. And that all came to a fairly soul-destroying halt in 2019 when I completely burnt myself out, which Mm. probably doesn't come as much surprise to a lot of people when they hear my story on on the surface. But despite me being a doctor who helped other people deal with stress and who actually even taught mindfulness and practiced mindfulness and meditated, I still completely burnt myself out and it was a pretty harsh revelation to to come to and it was a very difficult lesson to learn firsthand. Mm. <laughs> so I've spent the last two and a half years or so, I guess, consolidating some of that knowledge and then rebuilding in a really purposeful um, and deliberate way and actually starting to engineer my life with a bit of rest factored into it and prioritizing what's important and learning how to let go of the things that are outside of my control and that aren't so important. So lots of hard lessons learned. So if we can, can we go back to 2019 and talk about the sort of life that you were living and were there red flags and and what were they? And, and did you, could the people around you see the red flags or were you really good at hiding it as well? I think it's probably a bit of column A, a bit of column B on that Mm -hmm. front. I've always been a high-achieving person. I've always been used to being able to push through whatever barrier was in front of me and I could achieve what I wanted to achieve or what I set set my mind to. So, you know, you don't don't get into medicine and through specialty training and and that far down the path I was on without some degree of tenacity and being able to push through what appears to be hurdles. Mm. And I was just – I was used to that. So I, I did feel in that lead up to 29, it was June 2019 when I actually burnt myself out, I was feeling in hindsight a lot of those hallmarks of rising stress um, and really the hallmarks of burnout because, you know, stress is different from burnout. Obviously, unresolved and unmanaged chronic workplace stress leads to burnout eventually, but burnout is really... It's, it's pushing yourself. It, it's not growth. You're not sort of pushing into your growth edges. You are working on borrowed time. And and I was doing that for a very, very long time, just telling myself I was sort of pushing pushing my limits. And it was difficult, I guess, for those around me because 
there's, well, there was no precedent of me ever falling in a heap. <laughs> there was no real mm. precedent of me not being able to cope. So there was no reason for family and friends perhaps to suspect that I was pushing myself too hard. And certainly within my industry, within medicine, there wasn't cause for my colleagues to question it because so many of them were doing the same thing and, and you know, were feeling the same way. It was, and it still is, you know, it is quite accepted to be chronically stressed, to, to not be sleeping well, to not be switching off after work, to be working all hours of the day and night, taking your work home with you. This is, these are all very accepted sort of features for most of us in, in our day-to-day lives. And where's the point where that becomes burnout? Well, unfortunately for all of us, the only way you know that point is when you're looking at it in the rear vision mirror and you've gone well past it. Mm. So it's, it, it, yes, there were warning signs. Yes, there were red flags. Were they different from what a lot of people are probably experiencing in their lives right now? Probably not. <laughs> mm. was, there, was there an almighty crash that, that really pushed me over the edge? No, it was a pretty innocuous, sort of sequence of events and, and what actually the straw that broke the camel's back and really sort of sent me into a tailspin, triggered a series of panic attacks that sort of culminated in me just not even being able to get out of my front door. They weren't huge events in the scheme of things. I'd certainly weathered bigger storms in the past, but that cumulative load of just chronically poorly managed stress and, and you know, when we're talking about burnout, we are talking by definition of workplace stress, it was it had been mounting up for too long and, and I had just not heeded the warning signs. I've heard your story and it's not a nice one because it, it re- has required you to go through a pretty hard journey but in some ways probably saved your life. I think you say that when you had, you know, th- the moment – you felt like sort of the world was coming crushing down on you while you were getting, I think you were trying to get the kids into the car or getting off to school. Mm. Um, Can you talk about like physically what, what did happen? Like, as you said, you'd weathered harder storms. Was it just that your body said no and you just physically couldn't, couldn't go anymore? Is that, is that how bad it got to? Mm. And it's really interesting to look back when I, I mean, I can, I can actually detach myself from it in some ways and talk about it very non-emotively now mm. um, because I've had a lot of I've, I've had a lot of supported time in reflection and I've sort of done a lot of personal growth since then but certainly at the time yeah it was my it was my body giving up and I couldn't actually I couldn't pinpoint for you why that happened then and there but if I looked back over the sort of months and even probably the last couple of years before that there'd been changes in my work-life balance that were sort of being, they were quite insidious. I had tailored down my practice in medicine to a fairly niche area, Mm -hmm. which meant that I was increasingly professionally isolated. But I also had a patient population that was really quite intense and needy. I was working with new parents. And, And I was an expert in my field, surrounded by not a lot of other people doing the same work locally. So I was actually creating this sort of situation where I was intensely needed and I had this perception that I couldn't I couldn't switch myself off and that I couldn't sort of ever get away from it and this was part of my own when I look back my own coping mechanisms that perhaps I was quite fixed in my mindset of how I thought I had to be in terms of a doc being a doctor and that's something Mm. that I've worked on since but then as I sort of I kept taking on more and more work because I kept telling myself, you know, I have to help people if they need my help. I can't not do it. I I just have to keep going. So this workload was snowballing and I wasn't, I wasn't, even though I was working part-time because I had young kids, Mm. it was increasingly less part-time because there was so much more permeating into what otherwise would have been time that I was meant to be being a mum, being a wife, you know, doing the things that actually would have helped balance things out a little bit more although you know being a mum being a wife doesn't necessarily it's not easier it's not that it balances it out because it's easier than paid work it's just Mm. that having that sort of enriching different facets of my life would have been would have been something that probably I should have prioritized and then in the lead up to those last few months before I actually burnt out you know I wasn't sleeping well I was constantly waking up I I had rarely slept a full night's sleep 
at all that I could remember in those months leading up. I'd always wake at 3 or 4 a.m. with thoughts rushing through my head that I couldn't switch off. Um, I was feeling really overwhelmed by work. I'd get home and I'd be thinking about work constantly. And in, in medicine, one of the hallmarks that you find sort of approaching burnout is this increasingly defensive medicine where you're practicing as if you know, you're already worried about every rot thing that could go wrong and I'm practicing medicine in a way to try and defend myself against all these things that could go wrong when nothing had gone wrong. And so that hit, totally switches your mindset where you actually start to practice in a way that is defensive medicine, which isn't good medicine. Mm. Um, so there's, there were a lot of those hallmarks. And then in the sort of the actual lead up, I had this series of panic attacks. The first one, well, I'd never had panic attacks before. I'd never sort of had any any symptoms of anxiety or anything. And the first one didn't actually even feel like a panic attack. It was it was a really odd sense of feeling like I was I was dying, but being you know surrounded by people. I was actually I had committed to going to this 40th birthday of a friend of mine. I'm standing there holding my husband's hand, surrounded by people who I knew and who cared about me, and I'd never felt more alone in my life. I was just had this internal odd sense that my body was just caving inwards on itself mm-hmm. and that lasted about 48 hours and I sort of had the foresight to say well you probably need a break <laughs> and I had weeks of patients booked in so I, I booked myself in a week holiday a few weeks out and I just was hobbling along saying I need to get through I need to get through and it just you know I wasn't listening to this these rising symptoms in my body you know my heart was constantly racing I was feeling out of breath I was feeling exhausted even though you know I'd sleep and wake up exhausted I'd be waking up in the early hours and and ruminating about things and these are all hallmarks of really poorly managed stress but I just kept saying to myself I'm just stressed I just need to get through to that holiday and then it was a Thursday morning and as you said I was I had the kids ready for school they were all dressed and I was ready for work and I just I went to go out the front door and I just had this like this was a full blown physical panic attack where you just your heart racing, can't breathe, everything just really came caving in and it's again it, it it's you know, lots of people experience panic attacks. Why did this one stop me in my tracks? I don't actually know. I can't tell you why my body stopped, but it stopped that day and and I actually I haven't gone back to practicing clinical general practice since that day. Mm-hmm. And to some extent, I know that, you know, even two and a half years later, I'm not entirely sure if I'd be ready to do that because I had pushed myself so far into that borrowed time, mm-hmm. <laughs> borrowed energy, that the, the recovery since then has been stepwise. You know, I had to, I had to take six months off completely. And then I came back to doing surgical assisting, which I continue to do. And I've built up some other pursuits, some other work that is really, I'm really enjoying it. But that stress of managing patients still, I think I I wouldn't manage well with even this at this point, this far down the track. So I think it, it was a, it was a really huge point to have pushed myself to mm. And I don't think there's any way that I can describe it now that actually does honour that fact <laughs> mm. other than to say that, like I said before, you don't you don't know that you get to that point until you see it in the rear vision mirror. And, you know, any, with any one of us could be skirting just below that point at any given time. Oh, my gosh, I have so many questions. Um, I think for the cohort that will be listening to this, there is – would have pricked up when you said you had six months completely off because naturally our brain asks one question which is how did you do that did you have insurance (laughs) um can we talk about sort of I want to go more into helping advisors you know before they reach that point but before then I would love to share your story around how you did cope and what you wish you'd known before time and what worked and what didn't etc Mm. So I am eternally grateful to have put income protection insurance into place many, many years before, possibly part of my type A personality (laughs) and being in the industry that I'm in, I I was already filling in lots of forms for other people's income protection insurance. It, um, It certainly was something that was high on my agenda from a quite an early point in my career. So I had organized it and 
I did it through a broker and his wonderful advice to us at the time when my husband and I set it up was just do what you can afford now. I mean, you can, you can incrementally increase it or change it over the years as your, as your situation changes, but get it now and just get something in place now. And so in the scheme of things, it was, you know, we, we had sort of longer wait period. It was a shorter time that we actually are insured, that both of us were insured for. So we did what we could afford. And that I'm very, I am very grateful for because it meant that that, that six months, you know, the, the initial stress of having to sort of prove you're unwell enough to claim on it, that was awful. And I think for anyone who ever needs to claim on income protection insurance, it is, it, it is a really scary point because you sort of put this insurance in place, never, ever expecting to use it. <laughs> it's um, something that you really actually never, ever hope to claim on. And so the, the point of claim time can be a really scary point to get to. And there's a lot of fear, you know, will this be accepted? Is this, am, I, am I debilitated enough, even though you know that your life's literally crumbling around you? <laughs> um, and and that, in that regard, I was very grateful to have purchased our insurance through a broker because it meant that I did actually have a broker who was helping me to navigate that, that process. Um, and that was an unexpected, I guess, sort of positive from from the experience that he was very supportive and, and and very ready to sort of go into bat for me. I think having known me for many years by that stage, he could also see that I was I was pretty unwell. So it was very it was really helpful to to have his support and his help in the claiming time. In terms of having income protection insurance, I mean <laughs> I just tell everyone who'll listen that if you've if you've got an income worth insuring then you should be insuring it, you know, even even before, like we had, we had bought our house, and that's why we did it. Mm. And then we had the kids, and and after that, so it's. I think though, just do it if you if you have the capacity, and it's something you've been thinking about. It's it's really it's been the difference between me actually being able to take the time to get better, mm. and now build a life that actually is going to hopefully stand me in really good stead to not get not ever get back to that point ever again. Whereas had I not had this opportunity, I really do think I would have been jumping straight out of the frying pan into the fire of having to scrape life together again, which I don't think I would have come out the other side with the insights that I've gained through through my own process. We are very glad that you had income protection and that is really <laughs> what it's for. And yet so many people, particularly young type A personalities, as you call it, who are very successful, who can manage multiple things. You know, the classic is, I got this, I'm young and ferocious and I've got the world ahead of me to conquer. Um, I can't imagine what life would have looked like for you and your small family should you had not have had income protection. So very happy to hear that that helped you on your journey, <laughs> albeit um, insurers might need to think more about how they can make a less stressful claims process for genuine claims because you are not the first person who has told me that it is overwhelming. And the irony is you're going to claim because life is overwhelming and then to throw this process on board that is very overwhelming seems not very fair. Not very fair. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know where the balance lies because, again, I've, I've had experience on the other side of the table of, filling in these forms and supporting claims and doing all that sort of stuff as a GP. Mm. And it, it is hard to know where the balance lies because it, you know, it, it is an expensive industry. And wow. as much as I have now claimed on mine, I didn't ever go into it expecting to claim. And then I think very few people who ever claim on it, I really think you no know, one who, cl who claims on their in income protection insurance ever expects to claim on it. Mm. So, and, and I guess the, the vested interest of an insurer is always going to be to not pay out where they, where they don't have to. So how do you, how do you find that balance? And yeah, you, you're right. It could, it could possibly be less stressful, but then I, I don't have a, I don't have a sort of a really helpful suggestion as to how to make it less stressful at this point. No, that's okay. I think that's not your job. Your job is to look <laughs> after yourself. It's the insurer's job to figure that out. Um, so I don't know the exact industry research, but alas, we are up there as a profession of one of the most stressed 
mentally unwell in Australia as financial advisors. And sadly, throughout the last few years, we have lost a number of financial advisors due to self-harm and suicide. And so this is a conversation that I think needs to be very front and centre. We've gone through a royal commission. We have constant legislative change. You know, there are always bad apples that create media sensations and it, it does put into question all of the good work that we do every day. And by virtue of that, a lot of financial advisors today have probably woken up feeling quite stressed. And maybe some of the the signals that you were saying of you know, the sustained stress and the, sust- is it, is that really the burnout? Like what is the classic difference between signs of stress, which is, I guess, normal and, and overcomable versus burnout that's going to lead you to really significant detrimental health problems? Is it easy to identify? Short answer, no. Mm. Long answer coming your way. Um, the, <laughs> I mean, in terms of in terms of the short end, no, it's not it's not a really easy thing to identify because chronic stress is not healthy either. Mm. Whether or not it leads to burnout, it's, chronic stress isn't a great thing. Acute stress is actually an amazing thing. Our body responds to acute stress really well. It has a series of sort of physiological events that actually fall into place beautifully and allow us to respond to stress. And then as we then close off that stress cycle, everything comes back to normal. And then we can start again and mount the stress response again to the next stressor. But in the, I mean, in this modern world, the stress is constant. You know, there there isn't just, there is often we talk about the saber tooth tiger coming at you. There's not a saber tooth tiger trying to chase us down. In this modern world, you know, we are the saber tooth tiger because it's it's our thoughts. It's, it's, it's actually, it's coming home with us inside our heads. Mm. And then it's also the world around us. So we're just surrounded by saber tooth tigers, both inside and outside. And so how can you ever close off an acute stress response if you're constantly perceiving stress? So, yeah, chronic stress is not healthy either. It's not sort of if I have chronic stress but I don't have burnout, well, I'm just adapting and I'm rising to the challenge. So I guess in in answer to your question, whether or not it's chronic stress or whether or not it's burnout, it's still not healthy Mm. Burnout is probably that tipping point, like I said, that you that you know in the rear vision mirror where it's just it, it's gone, it, um, it's gone way too far. Unless you're very insightful and you can see it coming, which obviously I was not. But I mean, the hallmarks of burnout, the the World Health, well, the ICD-10, the International Classification of Disease, was included burnout in 2019, and. It, I mean, the definition that they give of what burnout is as a syndrome, it includes things like um, energy depletion, feeling exhausted, um, feeling more distance between yourself and your job and sort of switching off mentally from your job, not really engaging with it, feeling quite negative and cynical about your, your, your work. Um, and then just reduced per, um, professional efficacy, so not actually performing as well as you're used to. I mean, that's a fairly wishy-washy definition. Like, that applies to chronic stress too. <laughs> that most of those things would cover moments of chronic stress in our lives. So it's not an easy thing to define and whether or not you have to define it in order to actually do something about it, I think remains to be seen because neither of them are actually, they're not, they're not good things to be dealing with. What do you do if you think I am part of this camp what are the what are the ways that we can or or actually maybe I think someone in my team or the business that I run is starting to have some of these classic signs. I suspect it'll be us sort of looking at ourselves. I mean, I think about some of the things and I'm ticking boxes going, oh, this is scary. What do we do? How do we rectify this M? This is where I've had a lot of soul searching about, you know, the definition of burnout is very much about um, workplace factors. And in a lot of the definitions, it sounds like it's working within large organizations where you lack control. But really, I was self-employed. I was balancing parenting with my self-employed work, my own business. So it does apply to any sort of any sort of field. Mm. But the thing is that, yes, it's an occupational definition. But when it comes down to it, it's pervasive. This is spilled into the rest of your life. Even though I knew that I was, and, and in fact, when I took medicine out of the equation, when I stopped working for those six months, it was such a load lifted that I was actually pretty functional for those six months that I had off before I started to gradually in, increase my workload again. 
Mm. So there really was this huge centering on work. And that, I think, in the first instance, if it is possible for you, taking work out of the equation for an extended period, you know, often I, I sort of, I gave myself three weeks off when I first burnt out. I'm like, I'll take three weeks and I'll come back. Got to three weeks and I was still a mess. Spoke to the practice manager, she said, take some more time off. I got to sort of six weeks, still a mess. And at every point that I sort of gave myself, you know, in inverted commas, gave myself off, I got, I got to that point and the, that rising sense of fear and overwhelm and actually going back into that, that fire that had really burnt me out. I could feel it. It was palpable. It was a visceral reaction within me. And so an extended time off, I think it's pretty widely accepted that you're looking at around three months as a minimum if you're actually wanting to to start doing some of the, the work to come back into balance and perhaps manage chronic stress a little bit better. I mean, you think of last time we went on holiday. You're away for a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is. Generally, if it's a couple of weeks, you sort of, in coming back to work, you just straight back where you were, where you left off. It's maybe you get a few days grace where you're excited to be back and you missed your friends and your coworkers, but really you straight back where you left off. So actually having an extended period, period off where you can then check back in and perhaps start to spend some time in self-reflection work out. Are there personality traits that actually predispose me to working very hard, pushing my limits, not saying no, not ever being able to switch off. Maybe like I had a bit of a saviour complex. You know, there's a lot of things that actually then might contribute to feeling burnt out at work and, and taking some time to either do it on your own with the support of friends and family or maybe even some professional help with psychologists, counsellors, GPs to start unpicking some of those, those sort of patterns of behaviour that might be predisposing you to not managing chronic stress all that well. I think that's probably an important thing. Mm. But then I guess the the flip side is that often, you know, you, you see someone at work who's stressed and you'll say, just go home, just go home and take a day off. And it, while it's it's not a bad thing, if, like we said before, for most of us, the saber-toothed tiger is in our thoughts as well. You know, we, we're taking it home with us. So mm. you're stressed, overwhelmed, or chronically stressed and overwhelmed, you're at work, you've, you've gone past the point where you're actually able to manage this on your own you get sent home for the day, you're actually often still taking all that stress home with you. It's just you're then sitting uncomfortably with it at home on your own. <laughs> so I, that extended period off with some supported reflection and probably some supported work on, on your own sort of personality and behaviours is probably important. Is there a stigma in the doctor world, the medical world, probably called the medical world, is there <laughs> yeah. a stigma around doctors and mental health yeah definitely and we've got the added um, pressure which i'm not sure if you've got in your industry of the fear of being reported to our regulating body apra for any sort of issues around mental health which is it's a very scary thing when your livelihood is is working as a doctor is seeing patients but i mean it, it's probably a mis, misunderstanding in that really the only grounds to report a doctor with any mental health issues to APRA is if they were lacked insight and were perhaps endangering patients or, or anyone or themselves um, by poor practice. And that's, you know, that's not the same as having depression or anxiety, feeling burned out. You know, that doesn't mean that you lack insight. And there is definitely a stigma, though, that I think over time we are trying to chip away at mm. because we're no different, you know. <laughs> Just because we've gone to medical school and we've got a doctor before our name, doesn't mean that we are no longer human and mental health issues affect such a significant portion of the population you'd be naive to think that it's not affecting doctors and particularly in the industry that we work in with the things that we see and the people we have to help and the workload that we deal with it's it would be ridiculous to think that that mental health issues were not affecting this entire portion of the population hmm it's funny, so a lot of financial advisors in Australia are older and possibly come from that generation where mental health isn't seen or respected as it should be and, you know, sort of the old school, you'll be right sort of mentality, which clearly is not working given what I was saying before around the level of mental health issues that exist in our profession. Mm. Can we talk a little bit about 
mindfulness and why mindfulness is very important and we shouldn't think that it's some wishy-washy, dare I say, girly thing yep. and why it's so very important. Yeah. So, I mean, mindfulness is probably the, the, <laughs> the joy of my life these days and I, do, I teach it in so many different ways. It, it, um, it does bring me a lot of joy. The interesting thing is, though, that I learned about mindfulness uh, well over 15 years ago as a medical student. So I was practicing it to an extent as I burnt myself out. And in fact, it probably part of part of that was probably what allowed me to push myself so far beyond the limits of what I was capable of. Was you know I was treading water by doing yoga, meditating, practicing mindfulness, doing all these things that I tell my patients to do, and it bought me extra borrowed time. Mm. And and then I just sort of woke up to myself well past my, the limit of my capabilities and very overwhelmed. And so I think it's important to understand that mindfulness is, is it is a concept. It's a, it's a secular concept. It's not at all religious in any way, but it just gives us a framework in which to bring our awareness back into the present moment again and again and again. And I mean, that sounds so incredibly simple and straightforward, but if it was that simple, then why aren't we all doing it? Why are we all sort of ruminating about mistakes we've made in the past or worries about things coming up that may not even happen? Why, why are you in our heads so much? So it's not that simple. Um, it's certainly not the default state. And for most of us, myself included, even as I was listening to my, you know, diligently listening to my guided meditations before bed and practicing mindfulness, I wasn't really being mindful. I wasn't tapping into my own bodily awareness of how I felt you know, so how how stress actually felt in my body and the path that it took and, and how I allowed it to sort of move through me, what sort of thoughts and feelings felt like in my body and how, again, I, I could hold on to them lightly and allow them to pass and, and come and go. And what I found that I did more often than not was I was holding on to things and I was trying to force thoughts out of my head and I was worrying about things I've done in the past that I actually had no control over and I'm constantly stressing about things that are coming up. So I was very rarely actually living in the moment. I was living in a lot of different moments that were not the here and now um, and I had never had any control over the moments obviously that weren't the here and now. So this is what the practice of mindfulness gives us the ability to just remind ourselves to come back. So I mean if you think when you go home from work at the end of the day, it's been a busy day, perhaps you've made a few mistakes, perhaps you've got a lot of work coming up that you've multiple deadlines, lots of things mounting up. What are you, what's going through your head as you sort of come home, have some dinner, lie in bed? What's actually going on in your head at that point? For me, everything. Mm. <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking, I'm not very good at this. Um, None of us are. It's so hard and, and, and I too am someone who I'm really interested in this and, and I've gone and done yoga camps and I've gone and done meditation, you know, silent retreats, which people who know me would find quite comical. <laughs> um, I have, I've done more than one um, and I grapple with it, but then I have also learned that that is normal and that that is part of the journey and that your brain is a machine that is very good at staying on, which is fantastic for survival, but not ideal for the burnout and stress that we've been talking about today. But I'm also someone who lives at home alone. And so I find that really hard because I don't have someone else to distract me and talk about their day and what have you. And so, yeah, Em, I'm pretty, I'm pretty guilty of all of this stuff. So from, from a practical so we, sense, we all are. well, that makes me feel better. We, we, all, we all are. And even it's interesting you say that you, you're living at home, you don't have anyone to distract you because what the, the trap that most of us fall into is thinking that when I have these thoughts or feelings that I don't like, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable thinking about work deadlines or mistakes I've made or things that are outside of my control makes me feel uncomfortable. When we have them, the natural inclination we have is I'll distract myself from them. I'll scroll on my phone, I'll eat some food, I'll put the TV on, I'll call a friend and I'll chat for hours and then stay up way too late or I'll go for a run. I mean, some of these coping mechanisms are more healthy than others. Mm. But by and large, the coping mechanisms we engage in are about distracting ourselves from these thoughts. And the problem with that distraction is that we're constantly actually having, I mean, the thoughts don't go away, do they? They're always there. So we're constantly engaging in more practices, more stimulation in an attempt to distract ourselves from something we find uncomfortable. And what mindfulness gives us the ability to do 
is to actually realize that we don't need to distract ourselves from these these feelings, these thoughts. You know, it's kind of like you have a glass full of water. You put a teaspoon of sand into it. For most of us, we're living our lives stirring up that water. And it's all cloudy. It's all sand stirring around. That's what we're doing most of the time. And learning how to be still, perhaps it's through meditation, perhaps it's just through mindful self-awareness, we learn that stillness allows that sort of sediment, the thoughts and feelings that are in all of us to fall to the bottom of the glass. They're still there. We're not actually getting rid of any of those uncomfortable thoughts or feelings. We just change our relationship with them. So the, the problem isn't actually the existence of these uncomfortable thoughts or feelings. The problem is our attachment to those thoughts and feelings. And that's what mindfulness uh, really focuses on, is, is working through that attachment, that identification we have with the thoughts that are going on in our head, the feelings that arise within us. Do you know what I was thinking about this morning? I was sort of, I was pondering <laughs> self-care in contemplation of this chat. And I had sort of reflected, and I've, I've, I've been dangerously close, I think, to where you have been before. And I am the person that gets up, goes a million miles, crashes, gets up, goes a million yeah. miles and crashes. And my um, immunologist keeps reminding me that I have a body that can't do that, that I have to slow down. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, soon, mm -hmm. soon, 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 soon. Yeah, I'll do it later. Yeah. Um, when I've got time, cue never. Um, and, and I was thinking about myself and being really honest and vulnerable and saying to myself, you know, the times where I've been the closest to burning out, I've taken the least care of my body. We have so glamorized overwork and we've put success through such a fine filter in terms of what is success and what's deemed successful. And the times where people have probably thought for me personally, I'm doing the best, I'm probably doing the worst because when I'm in that state, Em, I don't move my body, I don't eat well, I don't sleep well, and I, yet I know all these things are needed. Why? Why is it, and I'm sure I'm not alone, why when we need it the most and we know what to do, why do we do the exact opposite of what our body needs from us? Because you don't learn to swim when you're drowning. You know, this expectation that we have that I can, I can live my life at 110% and I can push myself to the limit and then when I'm drowning, I'll just learn to swim then. I'll put all the healthy stuff into practice then. It's really, it's so counterintuitive when you actually break it down like that. But yeah. the frameworks, that we, the self-care frameworks that we put in place when we are well, when life is on an even keel, that's the safety net. That's what catches us when we're drowning. <laughs> but you don't learn to swim at that point. So all of a sudden going, I'm going to start meditating 20 minutes a day. I'll also go for a run. I'll do a Pilates class. I'll eat more vegetables and I'll... It, the reason you're at that point is because you're overwhelmed. You have outstripped your capabilities at that point in time, which means that creating a new habit, which takes a lot of time and energy, mm. is impossible. Mm. It means that actually being kind to yourself and showing yourself compassion and sort of slowing things down is really difficult because often that voice of the critic inside us is actually pretty loud at those points when we're, when we're really burnt out because it's our default voice for most of us. It's the one with the microphone in mm. the spotlight when we're feeling overwhelmed. Mm. And then the final thing is that it's actually, it's such a modern thing to think that, that rest is, is sort of wasteful time. And often we don't rest unless we're forced to, but it's, it's so subversive. Like saying to people now that I am scheduling in rest, that I take myself out for lunch, that I have days that I dedicate, you know, I, I run retreats with a beautiful colleague of mine. Um, we run them for doctors. And I know that those sort of four-day retreats are incredibly draining for me. And that's okay because I schedule in that week that I'm back, rest. That's, this is how I close my stress cycle. It's actual rest. It's not sort of rest while I'm sitting on my laptop watching a bit of Netflix, multitasking, it, that constant bombarding of stimulation. It is actual rest. And it's, you know, how many times have you actually spoken to someone and this is how they talk about their life, about their schedule? Prioritizing rest in my schedule has meaning taking a pay cut. Yeah, because it means that I'm actually not necessarily dedicating as many hours to work. But I've also learned the hard way what the alternative is. And that was quite a significant pay cut. So in the scheme of mm. things, this is actually less so. Mm. It also means that I have capacity. You know, this is, this is that closing of the stress cycle that then gives my body the ability to, to rebound, to respond, to have an acute 
stress response again. You cannot have an acute stress response from a grounding of constant chronic stress. All you're doing is just dialing up the chronic stress response. It's actually really hard to have a true acute normal stress response from a basis of poorly managed chronic stress. You're stressing me out talking about this because I'm guilty of so many of these things and it's beautifully ironic and that's why I wanted to have you on today because I suspect I'm not the only person. And and you're right, we have to live with an uncomfortable truth that we are so often so overstimulated and we have probably associated rest with being lazy. Yeah, and I mean I have a great analogy that I tend to use. So, I mean, it might not ring as true to, to non-medically minded people but basically the way our heart beats, um, so the cells of our heart, they, the electrical charge moves through the heart in a really coordinated fashion from top to bottom. And in order for that to happen, it, the, the electrical charge has to move from one cell to the next, to the next, to the next, down the path. That contracts the muscles, that pumps the blood. It has to be really coordinated. And as each cell discharges, it goes into a restful state where it then is allowed to repolarize. And it, it cannot have another beat until that restful state where it discharges all the electrical activity, comes back to zero and then can be charged again. It can't beat normally unless it has that restful state after each charge. And this is this is our heart, these are the muscles of our heart. Okay, so that, that restful state is so important to our, the fundamental part of us, you know, our being. It pumps blood around our body. Without it, we don't exist. Rest is important in every heartbeat. How many times does our heartbeat a day? Tens of thousands. And every heartbeat has to conclude with rest. Mm. So a stress cycle, you know, it, it cycles. Cycles are ubiquitous with everything that lives in the world. You know, <laughs> plants and seasons, everything. Everything cycles. Everything that is alive cycles. Mm. And our stress cycle, rest is always that point as of the baseline. It is so important. You know, you think about what happens even to the, in the natural world. You think about what happens in winter when things lay dormant and then after winter we have spring and everything rebounds like it is that point of rest is actually so important in order to then start again and we cannot have a full cycle of anything in the natural world without a rest being part of the cycle and yet as humans we've totally forgotten that we're bringing it back here and now today we're that rest. We're starting a yeah, movement it is and it's but it, it, it is an uncomfortable first step because one, you're going to be judged for it or you're going to feel as though you're judged. So you'll get an uncomfortable feeling because you'll feel as though other people are judging you. Mm. Two, you'll probably judge yourself. <laughs> that, that inner critic is a pretty loud voice for most of us. And you find yourself having to justify, oh, I'm resting because, and you know, you're know, you over justifying why I've scheduled in a day of rest. And then you also often, we notice that when it's so unused to resting, that when we come to rest, it feels uncomfortable. We, we keep busy, we scroll, we do all sorts of things because rest in itself, our bodies have forgotten how to do it. Totally, totally. I Yes, I have had to learn how to rest. I had someone point out to me that I was watching a film that I just can't sit and watch a film. I have to, I can hear the washing machine go and so I'm quickly putting the dryer on or the dishwasher or folding clothes and I have spent the last probably t- two years and I'm still not there yet actually learning how to switch off. I'm getting much better and I think it is a bit like what you said, like it's a muscle that has to be sort of worked regularly to learn how to do it. But I would say even with that level of awareness, I'm still on a journey and I think you talk about this as well. Like maybe it's a journey with no destination and we're just all constantly learning how to do it better. But I completely agree, especially with social media and the temptation that there's always stuff to consume. Mm. You have to override the want to be back and absorbed in that world. Yeah, I mean, the override is interesting, though, because this is like trying to push those uncomfortable thoughts out of our head. What mindfulness teaches us, it's not about overriding that uncomfortable desire. It's about noticing it. And then perhaps, you know, with a curious mind, we start to, it changes over time as we notice it non judgmentally. Mm. I notice when I feel uncomfortable, I reach my phone. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, mindfulness mm. gives us that ability to notice things about ourselves that we perhaps wish were different, but notice them non-judgmentally. And that first step of any sort of behaviour change cycle is learning how to notice something non-judgmentally. You know, change rarely happens from guilt and berate, berating ourselves. 
Mm. Change happens through showing ourselves compassion and gently, you know, small changes amplified over time bring about huge changes. You know, it's about those little ripples that we're able to start over time. They become amplified and and that becomes sustainable behaviour change. Oh, my goodness, I have so much to learn. Thank you. In the interest of time, uh, I'd like to fire off some rapid-fire questions if I can, and then I would love for people to learn clearly learn much more about this topic because I feel like we have only just scratched the surface. So learn more about where they can learn more and learn more about the great work that you do. Can we do some rapid fire questions? Yeah, hit me. I think you'll like this one. This is one that I give to everyone and I feel that you'll be proud that I even include it. What is one thing you do to look after your mental health? I pick my kids up from school. I love it. It makes me smile. Oh, that's so beautiful. They always, they're so happy when they see you waiting there. They run at you with their school bag. It, it is amazing. It's such a little joy in my life. Oh, my gosh, so cute. Uh, <laughs> one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? You've got some hard lessons coming up, but they're worth learning. Mm. What's something big that's on your bucket list that you haven't ticked off yet? I'm going to put myself on a TED stage. Ooh, that's exciting. Mm. Love yes. That. Yeah, it's definitely on the bucket list. It's getting closer. (gasps) Stay tuned. Um, (laughs) I have a fake book club. Do you have a book for me to put on my fake book club? Yes, one of my favourites. So Rick, Dr. Rick Hansen um, has The Buddha's Brain. um, It's the neuropsychology of health and happiness, I think. It's a beautiful book. It's about about neuroscience and meditation and mindfulness and it's a a lot of really interesting stuff. You'll devour it. The Buddha's Brain. The Buddha's Brain. Got it. Thank you. Now, how can people find out more about all of the amazing work that you do? So my website, mm-hmm. www.drdremilyamos.com. And I also am pretty active on social media, um, at Dr. Emily Amos on Facebook and um, Instagram. And I've also got my podcast, which you have been a wonderful guest on. So that's mm-hmm. the, the Mind Life Me podcast. Amazing. We'll add links to those in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for such an important conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Emily Amos. Thanks for having me. Same time.